and uh, we're, we're, now, we're now remarkably five minutes behind, but uh, I will try and fix that. Now, before I get started, um, this is, this is a, a broad overview, and there's going to be some slides moving pretty quick, so just think of it as flash photography. So if you see people who are suddenly starting to shake and fall on the ground, we'll know why. But uh, um, the, the other thing is, is that I actually finished this ahead of time, i.e. 7.57, and I didn't check it when it went to the main computer. So it, it's going to be a voyage of discovery. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a, a very broad overview, and I said very flippantly earlier on about, well, let's put up a picture of the near side and the far side, and yes, that's where we want to go. I'm, and, and to a point, that, that could, well be, uh, could well be an answer that, if we go to places that we haven't been before on the moon, we're going to learn a whole bunch of, of new things. Um, what we have already learned since Apollo is that um, we need to go back, number one. But uh, we, we now have global data sets that have opened, uh, opened up this idea of, of lunar terrains, which is you know, coming up on 18 years old since the publication of this paper back in 2000. Uh, from Brad Jolliffe and co-authors, that we, we do have these very distinct, compositionally distinct and, and uh, terrains that are present on the moon, and that you can see that the Apollo landing sites uh, were pretty much straddling the boundary of the Prosolar and Creep terrain, um, and basically were dominated by, uh, by those materials. Uh, the, the, the Soviet lunar missions were on the eastern limb uh, of the near side, and they were a little more um, free of that material, but they didn't exactly bring back as much as Apollo. Uh, the other thing that became obvious is that the, uh, the Apollo sample collection is, uh, is not representative of the, the types of materials that, are, that actually are present on the surface. Uh, we are now getting more and more lunar meteorites, um, but we, don't, we know they came, come from the moon, but where on the moon becomes a bit of a, a, bit of a game to play. Um, and uh, also, these meteorites are subject to terrestrial weathering and alteration, so we have to see through, uh, sometimes have to see through a lot of those, uh, those effects in order to find out more about our nearest neighbor. Yeah, with, the, uh, with the Japanese uh, uh, Selene mission, Kagua, uh, the idea of pure anorthosite was, was, was uh, proposed, and it is present um, on the surface of the moon that we can see from orbit at the, uh, the pixel size of the instruments on the, uh, on, on the orbiter there. And also with uh, M cubed on uh, the Chandrayaan-1, uh, Carly Peters' group uh, introduced us to OOZ, the olivine orthoperoxene spinel lithologies. Uh, it's, it's a great acronym, and I think it's one we can OOZ, you know. We can, uh, and it's... Uh, it's something that we, we sort of have a hint at in, uh, in one lunar meteorite and in a few Apollo samples. But the, the, you've got to remember that the pixel size of the, of the MQ instrument means that these are large outcrops dominated by these different minerals that we simply don't have any record of. Um, and then the recognition of olivine-rich uh, materials starts to debate, well, are we actually seeing mantle at the, uh, at the lunar surface. Um, there's lots of arguments why it is and lots of arguments why it isn't. And what we really need is ground truth to actually go and figure out what is going on. Um, we, we knew from the Apollo collection that we had uh, granitic and felsic materials, these high silica, high thorium, little bits of uh, material, 1.5 grams in a breccia from Apollo 14, uh, then a few rocklets from Apollo 12, uh, and also Apollo 17. But then with these orbital data sets, we started to see these, these high, high silica, uh, very felsic uh, igneous constructs that, uh, that are huge. Uh, on the surface of the moon and trying to fit those in with what we knew from uh, the Apollo samples and the global data sets, we had to start revisiting how the moon evolved. And, uh, you know, can, can these actually be uh, constructed through silicate liquid emissibility, which was the way that the small samples were explained um, back during the 70s, 80s, and 90s? 
We also uh, found out that uh, although the Apollo uh, and lunar meteorite samples suggested that the, the maximum period of, of volcanism and magmatic activity was uh, three to four billion years ago, but we started to see from these orbital data sets that there were potentially areas that were much younger than that. This has great implications not only for the, uh, the thermal evolution of the moon, but also the compositional uh, heterogeneity that is present within the lunar mantle. And uh, you can see here this work by Harry Hiesinger, uh, just using crater counts uh, to, to show that there on the, on the lunar near side, there are some uh, what we term young, billion years old, eh, pretty young, um, basalt flows that are present on the surface of the moon. Then with the LRO, uh, and especially the uh, camera, LROC, uh, we started to see these, these very these irregular Mari patches uh, that were interpreted uh, to be 100 million years old or less than that uh, in terms of the paper that came out in, uh, by Sarah Braden and co-authors back in 2014. But these have also been interpreted um, by Lionel Wilson and, and Jim Head as being much older constructs. So there's, there's a little bit of controversy going on in the literature with regard to the origin and evolution of these. If these are very young, they, they hold implications for the thermal evolution of the moon um, and also uh, the compositional heterogeneity. But if they're very old, how the heck did they survive in the way that they did um, over that length of geologic time? So what are the ages of these, these irregular Mari patches? You know, um, what are the source regions? Uh, what is the implications for the thermal history of the moon? What are the mechanisms of eru eruption? These are all very sciencey questions, and people like me get very excited when we start to talk about them. Other people in the room will probably fall asleep, but don't worry, there's more. <laughs> Cratering chronology becomes important because uh, we've used the, the Apollo samples to constrain a small portion of the crater count curve. The, in terms of the uh, um, inner solar system. There's a debate about whether there was a cataclysm, and uh, Brett talked about that in the first talk. Um, but we need impact melts from known craters to actually constrain this crater curve, because we're applying that to places such as Mercury and also Mars, and uh, we need to get it right. Uh, we don't have samples from Mercury. We have a few samples in terms of meteorites from Mars. Um, but we're using the moon as the linchpin to understand the impact history of the inner solar system. So uh, we need unambiguous samples uh, of impact melt from these basins, um, especially South Pole Aiken, and that's a segue into the next talk, but I'm not done yet. So uh, you'll have to wait for that one. But we need to understand this, this flux. And LRO has done an excellent job of understanding uh, what the present day flux is in terms of impacts uh, into the lunar surface. Um, it's been up there since 2009 and has done a great job in capturing these new craters. Pyroclastic deposits become um, important uh, not only for their scientific interest, these fire fountain glass beads into a vacuum and, and Jack found the orange soil um, at Apollo 17, uh, but now we've, we've started, and it's a good job we curate samples. Thank you, Ryan and everybody at JSC, because you know, in 2008, samples that were collected back in 1971 were actually shown to contain volatiles, and it changed our idea of the moon basically uh, since then in terms of volatile-rich reservoirs within the interior of the moon. Now, that has a, a, a follow-on um, implication in terms of, well, how much of the volatiles are present? And the Lee and Millikan paper, 2017 in Nature Geoscience, um, started to use orbital data to show the hydration signature in some of these pyroclastic deposits. Um, that is critical if we're going to be using these as a resource to support human presence on the surface of the moon. Not only that, but also use these resources to then um, create fuel so that the humans can go further afield, i.e. the moon becomes the enabler for deep space exploration. But we're also interested in the science stuff. And uh, we need to, to visit some of these other volatile deposits uh, to see whether or not we have 
um, the same hydration signature throughout geologic time or whether there is a depletion in that. The far side highlands, um, again, uh, there's lots of debates about why we have a crustal dichotomy. It's thicker on the far side than it is on the near side. That's why most of the basalts are on the, uh, are, are on the near side. But then also there's the idea of a primitive nature to those far side highlands. And we, we have lunar meteorites that probably come from the far side, but we don't exactly know exactly whether or not they came from there or where on the far side they came from. So samples then become key in understanding exactly how did the lunar crust form. We can all create models. Models are great if you only have sparse data because everything works. As soon as you get more data, well, this is job security for a scientist. So. And then we get to the permanently shaded regions um, where we have these hydrogen deposits and other volatile deposits. Uh, you can see here from the, the poles, um, now League has done a couple of uh, specific action teams on, on these volatiles to actually look at the resource and science potential um, there. And, and LCROSS, uh, another AIMS mission, becomes vitally important because it gives us our one ground truth point in terms of what volatiles are actually present in some of these permanently shaded regions. Um, so we now know what to go after in terms of which regions to explore, and we have a whole session this afternoon that's going to talk about that. So sample return is very important as well as in situ science. I'm going to focus on sample return because I like samples. So this is just my, my, uh, uh, my bias. So I mean, we've got new lithologies, uh, including potential mantle samples. Um, we've got the South Pole Aiken Basin impact melt. Um, we won't talk about moonrise. Um, other, other younger uh, craters to constrain the younger end of the crater count curve, and then multi-ring basins to look at the impact process. Young volcanic features, felsic domes, large pyroclastic deposits, and cryogenic sample return, possibly, or in situ science in some of these permanently shaded regions. Now, this is where the fun starts. So if we want to go find spinel lithologies, these are some regions where we could go based upon the orbital data. This is on the near side. This is on the far side. If we then want to go look for mantle, potential mantle deposits, this is some places we could go on the near side, and there's on the far side. If we then look at this pure anorthosite that uh, has been reported, these are some potential locations on the, uh, on the near side, and these are on the far side. Now, these are not every, every uh, location that has been depicted, but these give examples. If we want to go look at spinel lithologies, we have a number of sites that we can look at and pick the best one in terms of safety and also science and exploration that we can get out of that. It's not just one site in most cases. There are several sites we can choose from. If you want to look at felsic uh, igneous complexes, we can see that we have a lot of near side options and we have one on the far side. So we've learned a lot since Apollo from these orbital missions. It's now time to get down and dirty to the surface and start looking at uh, these places in situ, but also with eventually sample return. The pyroclastic deposits, very important for both science and exploration in terms of being able to sustain um, life on, uh, off planet on the surface of the moon. The near side, and then we go to uh, far side. Again, not all inclusive. Go to Lisa Gaddis's map at the USGS, that is all inclusive. But this just gives us an idea. And if you look at the uh, um, Liam Millican paper in 2017, Nature Geoscience, then uh, you will get the idea of which ones contain this hydrated signature. The young igneous, I've just put a couple of examples up here in terms of uh, the Rorus basalt and also the Ina complex. Uh, to test those particular theories in terms of in situ science, get an age date, it'll still, you'll be able to tell whether it's less than 100 or three and a half billion. And then impact melts to constrain 
the, uh, the, the crater curve in more detail. Near side, with some of the younger craters that have generated impact melt that we can use. And then far side uh, with, well, I'll pick a crater, lots of options. You can see the far side has definitely had the snot beaten out of it. And then hydrogen deposits. Near side, important for being able to communicate direct to Earth. But if we have a communications network, we can also get uh, over to the far side and get some of those craters that go round the far side that may contain higher abundances than those that we can actually see with the direct uh, communication to Earth. And that's the summary, the multicolored plot that gives us an idea of where some of the interesting places are on the moon to go visit for in situ science, for sample return, for a science and exploration potential for those. Um, not talking about uh, um, networks or, or deployment of global networks. Rene is going to be talking about that after Brad. But uh, we, we've, I'd like to say we haven't, we, we've just scratched the surface of the moon. This is a whole new moon based upon the missions that have come after Apollo. It has now given us a, a map to get to the surface to actually ask these really fundamental questions, science questions, but also important for exploration, for human exploration, being able to use the resources that are present on the surface of the moon to sustain a permanent presence there that would then enable much deeper, deeper space exploration with humans to places such as, oh, I don't know, let's say Mars. That would be, uh, that's, that's one place, probably better than Venus. So in terms of sample return, there are some technology developments. Uh, some of these are further along than others, but I've highlighted here because volatiles has come up time and again. Cryogenic sampling, transport, and curation is going to be a grand challenge in terms of bringing back some of these ices, whether that be from these permanently shadowed uh, craters on the moon, whether it be from an ocean world, whether it be from a comet. We can learn how to do this on the moon because it's close. We know where it's going to be. We can go test our technologies on the moon to actually be able then to undertake uh, more risky missions further afield. So the moon becomes then our enabling test bed in order to do it. And coming back to the private companies, we're going to hear today about capabilities. This is the game changer, as I said earlier on. You know, we will need a regular cadence of missions, not just one here, one there. We will need a program if we are going to enable the, uh, the private sector to help out with getting back to the surface and enabling this science and exploration uh, that, uh, that Jim talked about, Ben talked about, Brett talked about, and now I'm waxing lyrical about. Um, so maybe a, maybe a lunar program. That would be a good thing to have that is long-lived, as, uh, as Jim talked about, that, that is robust enough to withstand administration changes. I was going to suggest a 10-year presidential appointment, but I've changed my mind on that. <laughs> I'm not politically correct. So, uh, um, and uh, again, again, this, this focused program allows NASA to become a regular customer. Maybe other agencies or entities can become a regular customer Again, so that we can then really start to address on a decadal scale the issues that come up in these decadal surveys rather than have to carry things over to the next decadal because we didn't quite get there this time. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, hello, hello, David Kring, LPI. We know who you are, David. Thanks, thanks, Clyde. Um, so I have two thoughts. One, I just want to emphasize the point you're making, that sample return is so, so important. We keep developing ideas and models, and we have to get samples to test them and resolve them. The, the more important uh, 
or another important point I want to make is um, half of the lunar surface has um, remained unexplored. It's the far side. We've not been to the surface yet. We've not collected any samples from the far side. And to do that, we need a calm relay. It is a basic part of any science or human infrastructure. Somebody, whether it's private or NASA, needs to uh, find a way of making that happen. Uh, SND, I think, has a comm satellite that would be available to do that. It just needs to be tasked to do that. Um, but basically, half the moon is going to remain unavailable to us unless that is resolved. It's really important. Yep. Thank you, David. Hey, Clive. So, uh, two points. One, um, if we were to get samples back from the far side of the moon and we had a point of reference, then all these lunar meteorites, where we're not sure That's where they're point. from, it still would be a little bit uncertain. But yep. then we would have many more samples that we were rel reasonably certain came from the far side and would greatly increase what we were able to know about it. And since you showed it last, and it's a small point, but you showed it last, so I remembered, um, one of the technology developments that I think needs to be thought about is the ability to bring samples back sealed. Right now, yes. anything that's yep. based on like the Stardust sample return canister, you know, it comes back open, it's filtered, but I mean, a little bit of air goes a long way to changing the surface properties of these samples, and there's a lot of important science that can be done yep. if they can be brought back sealed. Yep. And that requires, I mean, Jax is doing it with Hayabusa, so it, it can't, we did it in Apollo, it can be done. It's harder, it's a little more expensive, but I think right. that's an important point. Yep. Um, and it would greatly increase the importance of the samples you're bringing back. Okay. All right, we're going to have to crank through the questions. No more questions after these three, please. Humphreys, ASMS, ASMS Inc. Um, I agree with your private industry. We should look at, as a community, to make sure that there's flexibility yep. and upgradability with the habitation modules and not restricted by the berthing docking mechanism. So, because otherwise you're fixed with this berthing docking mechanism 10, 15 years down the road, yep. Yep. and you're holding cell phones which are upgradable. Okay, if you can't get things in and out of a habitation module, you're causing serious problems for the science community. Thank you. Yep. just want to piggyback off of David's comment regarding a comm satellite and add my own take, which is I completely agree with him, but a comm satellite without a dedicated remote sensing suite would also be a wasted opportunity. Uh, if there's one thing we can learn from Mars and take into our uh, you know, lo you know, lunar, you know, lunar program is that every time we increase the spatial resolution of our uh, imaging and spectral and chemical data sets by you know roughly an order of magnitude we undergo a complete paradigm change in terms of our understanding of the surface yeah so. I understand that I want to push back a little bit because a com, com satellite won't be that close to the lunar surface number one and I, and I would would uh, we need to be very careful not to Christmas tree it um, so I, I think I think you need to to think about two satellites uh, huh Oh, you, now you're getting greedy, and same to you. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> but but uh, but I, I think you need to need to you know, we need to think that one through, in terms of you know, the, if the comm satellite is at uh, at uh, you know, at L2, then the remote sensing may be limited. Sure, that's a perfect. But, fair point. Okay. And I also want to add to uh, what David Kring said. If you have a, it, it, because it brings up a real problem, sorry, Martin Elvis, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, it brings up a, a problem of conflicting requirements, conflicting uh, needs, because of course the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon is ec the uh, one place in the solar system we can put a low frequency cosmology telescope. Yep. So astronomers yep. really don't want a radio transmission coming from L2. Yeah, I know, I so, know, I know. Maybe you want optical comm, but yeah, we'll we switch it off for five minutes a day. Conflicts. How about, how about Yep, understood. They'll want to work 24-7. All right. Thank, thanks, everyone. Let's move on to the next.